President Obama's decisive win, claiming 50% more electoral votes than Mitt Romney, partially masks a relatively close popular vote margin, Obama winning by just over 2% by that measure. It's not the crisis of a contested election some feared, but it again raises the question, why do we have the Electoral College and should we? To answer those questions, we're joined by Sal Anuzas, a senior advisor to National Popular Vote, an organization attempting to overhaul the Electoral College, and for the counterpoint, John Samples, director of the Cato Institute's Center for Responsive Government. Thank you uh, both for joining us. Good to see you. Great to be with you. Uh, so we should start with why we should have change, I suppose, Sal. What's wrong with the Electoral College? Well, it's the Electoral College itself isn't a problem. It's the winner-take-all system that we have uh, in allocating the electors to the Electoral College. We distort public policy by having ethanol because of Iowa or prescription D because of Florida or steel tariffs passed by a conservative president because of Pennsylvania as we pander for votes in the battleground states. Um, and at the same time, you basically have 40 states that p become flyover states. It's in the Constitution, though. How do you change it? Well, very simply, the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, gives the right to the legislatures to decide how electors are chosen and sent to the Electoral College. So we have a legislative process uh, called the National Popular Votes Compact that can be passed state by state, where states agree to participate in this compact. And when states that have enough of 270 electoral votes or more agree to participate together, they will allocate their electors state by state based on who wins the national popular vote. So what you guys are doing is a little complicated, so I just want to explain it in a little more detail. What you're saying is what the states will do is they'll allocate their votes. No matter how their state votes, they'll just follow the national popular Correct. vote. And if enough states do that, then it's kind of an end around. Well, only when enough states do that does a compact take effect. So when there's enough states that have 270 votes or more doing that, then they start allocating their electors based on the national popular vote. And that basically does two things. It guarantees that the person who wins the most votes in this country becomes president of the United States. And it also guarantees that whosoever vote is cast anywhere in the country, that my vote is just as important as a voter in Ohio or Florida because every single vote will count. John, seems sensible to have a, a popular vote winner, no? Well, look, I mean, the, the Constitution does set out in Article 2 how the president's to be elected. It was an issue that was much debated. So it seems to me that if we want to do something differently, we ought to uh, amend the Constitution to do that. And it's all and uh, national popular vote. And other people can make their arguments. And we probably do need a good debate about this. That would be fine. But we ought to do it that way rather than through the compact method. I should point out also, though, that the concern for this really began in 2000. 2000, you got a, uh, popu a split between the popular vote and the Electoral College winner. Last night, what we saw was really a more of a normal kind of Electoral College uh, outcome. And one of the arguments for the Electoral College uh, in its uh, real existence is in history is that it does do, produces great, small results turn into larger outcomes and gives some stability to the system and some legitimacy to the winner, which after all, you know, is a very close outcome. And I also would point out that it really is true that not a majority of states would benefit from direct population popular election. We don't know what the future is like, but it, we, can't, we can't be absolutely sure that it's going to produce uh, for a majority of the states a better outcome in terms of presidential attention. Uh, let me give one more piece of pushback. Money in politics. It's already very expensive to run an election. Sure. It will only be more expensive when you have to get up in the New York and Los Angeles and Chicago media markets. Doesn't that close the window to anyone who doesn't have a boatload of money? The, the political reality today is it takes two things to win an election, money and everything else. And I don't see that changing. Money you is don't a think money will be more important in a popular vote system? No more than it is today. Money is a determinant factor, whether it's in primaries as to who becomes the nominee or in the general election. I mean. This was a unique situation where both campaigns for the first time in our history spent over a billion dollars each. That's phenomenal. I would point out one thing. Over our history, a lot of people who have studied this believe that we spend a fixed amount of our GDP on presidential elections. So we may have a kind of ceiling we're working within. And it would be easy if uh, Saul turns out to be right about, say, those Republican voters in California. Just remember, you're spending a lot per voter in Ohio yesterday, you could spend less there and switch it off to California so that you end up under that ceiling that we apparently have in America and spending about the same amount of money. Thank you both. Okay, Great thank you for having me.